This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast for the Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another podcast of Living the Wildlife, or should I say vodcast at this point, because we are a video as well, so we're really glad to have you along, and we are part of the Pest Geek Podcast family, so we're going to talk today about some issues with wildlife control, but first let me just sort of wish everyone to take a little time and fill in and subscribe to the podcast or the vodcast whichever you prefer and uh, take a few moments and drop me a line about some topics that you would like to have covered in the future i deal with vertebrate pest control and uh, so i'm not really a bug guy although i'm learning about bugs i'm primarily of a vertebrate guy so those are the topics that i talk about here on the living the wildlife vodcast so subscribe to our channel you want to drop me a note send it to wildlife control consultant at gmail.com wildlife control consultant at gmail.com would love to have you do take some time to visit the website as well as i have a blog and you can subscribe to that i try to post something about at least once once a week so today i wanted to talk about something that's sort of been bothering me for a while as uh, some of you may know i work for a state agency that's part of a, that's in charge of regulating pesticides within a particular state i'm not here speaking on behalf of my job in the state however my work with the state does expose me to information that um, is sometimes unusual that's not well known and so uh, because I specialize in vertebrate control uh, I find some strange things when I'm dealing with pesticides this just, just put it out I actually have a list of all the weird stuff I've found in various labels as I'm reading them and uh, it's, how does this stuff how did this stuff ever pass review right but obviously the EPA has a lot of labels to deal with and I'm sure it can be mind-numbing on their part but stuff kind of sneaks through and this is one I, I don't know whether to call it a mistake or whether it's an oversight or whether it's the result of a legal technicality snafu that just hasn't been worked out yet and I wanted to bring it up because one of my passions is I want people to follow pesticide labels of course the label is the law we've heard that over and over and over again but we want to be sure that the labels are written in a way that's actually that makes sense and this is an issue that I've encountered that I wanted to make the Pest Geek Podcast family aware of it and get your thoughts on it because it certainly puzzled me. I've been in contact with the EPA about it. They do recognize that there is an issue here and they're going to probably explore it. Um, but in the meantime, it's going to be a little difficult to get that changed. Obviously, the, the wheels of government move slowly, right? So sometimes mind-numbingly slowly. But So uh, let me bring this up to you, and uh, I'm going to just throw it out there and uh, let you decide how you're going to how you're going to deal with it okay so why don't we why don't we get started so let me open up this particular browser and i bring this up this is from the pesticide stewardship.org site this is an organization dedicated to trying to educate the public and pest control operators about the better use and understanding of pesticides and it's an important organization and they have a page here and let me just sort of list it here notice they have something in bold here and it says use of any pesticide in any way that does not comply with label directions and precautions is illegal. I'm sure all of you that deal with pesticides would, would give this a hearty amen, right? This is right. Of, of course it's illegal, right? Because we are hearing over and over again, the label is the law, the label is the law. And so I just wanted to sort of highlight this point here and now I want you to keep that fact in mind because now we're going to go to another particular issue. 
voles. Now, here we have an issue on voles, and of course you all see this is a publication from Wisconsin. This is uh, from the Wisconsin, I believe it's their extension organization up there. Pretty neat, very nicely well done, laid out publication. This is from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture seems to have had some help in here by Jesse Coyen and Ben Martini. David Drake, Extension Wildlife Specialist Professor, and it's a really beautiful, well laid out publication here on voles. All right, so here we have some vole damage, really neat stuff. Then it talks a little bit about some of the identification of some of these voles. And it talks about the meadow vole. You probably all heard about the meadow vole, the prairie vole. And they have the southern redback vole and the woodland vole, also called, many of you may have known it as the pine vole, but I guess that's not the technical name for this animal. Uh, we don't have pine voles where I live, but we certainly have the meadow vole and we certainly have the prairie vole. Those are two of the most widely distributed voles in the United States. Probably the meadow vole might have uh, an upper edge in terms of land area. But the prairie vole is pretty big too. And so certainly when it comes out to the areas of the Great Plains. So there you see some beautiful damage by uh, some voles. You know, pine vole will certainly chew up the bark like this, but other voles will certainly do that as well. And it gives you some information. But what I want you to look at here is notice how similar all of these voles are in terms of their appearance. Now the bottom one is a lemming. Just want to throw that out there, but it has a lot of vole-like characteristics, right? And here we have the southern redback vole, but that one certainly has pretty big ears for a vole, if you ask me. But anyways, I'm not familiar with that one because we don't have them where I where I live. But we have the meadow vole, prairie vole, and uh, woodland vole, pine vole. But notice they all kind of look the same. And what what are characteristics of voles? They have very short ears. They have sh typically short tails. The long tail vole would be an exception for that, but typically the tails are rather short where a mouse tail tends to be over 50% of the length of the body, where a vole tail tends to be below 50% of the length of the body. Uh, mouse, mice have large ears, voles have small ears, and voles tend to be in grassland or woodland where mice can be in structures as well as outdoors as well. So there's a habitat difference. Now there's also a habitat difference when it comes to meadow vole and prairie vole. As a rule of thumb, meadow voles tend to be in much more moister environments like wet meadows. Prairie voles tend to be in much drier climates. Uh, prairie obviously is pretty dry and so prairie voles will have their burrows uh, they'll have surface runs as well, but they'll have they'll usually have holes like someone took a, a, a one inch pole and just rammed it into the soil periodically in these clusters of holes. That's classic of prairie vole, where meadow voles tend to have their nests more closer to the surface and may have surface nests because obviously it's hard to dig in moister soil, especially if it depending how moist it is. Now vole, meadow voles will be below ground as well but meadow voles tend to be a little bit more surface oriented than the prairie vole. So there are some differences. However, both voles can occupy the same habitat. Huh, did you know that? That's important. Now, remember what I just said before, I said the label is the law, right? So the label is the law. So let's take a look at this. I wanna, let's take a look at a few labels. Here's one from Matomco, and by the way, I'm not picking on these, these products, right? I had to just pick some because there are plenty of examples, but I had to, I obviously, you wouldn't want to sit here for two hours and let me show you dozens of labels like this, right? That would be silly. Uh, so it's not nothing personal against these companies. Uh, we're just showing you some labels to point, to, just to illustrate my point, but these companies are that I'm listing here are not unique. All right, so I'm just trying to drive a point home here. So look at this particular label here. We're gonna let me try to let me blow it up a little bit more for you, so you don't have to squint too hard. Use restrictions. Notice this product may be used to control the following rodent pests. 
in and around man-made structures. This is a this is a standard rodenticide, structural rodenticide label. This is a general use product, by the way. And it lists the species you're allowed to control with this. And you have to be within 100 feet with your bait station of a structure, a permanent structure. Common, nothing unusual about that. Dozens and dozens of labels have this language. Notice what it says. House mouse, Norway rat, roof rat, cotton rat, eastern harvest mouse, golden mouse, Polynesian rat, meadow vole, white-throated wood rat, southern plains wood rat, Mexican wood rat. That's it. Meadow vole. Well, that's weird. Um, I thought I said that prairie vole and meadow vole can occupy the same habitat. Well, if you're in the Northeast, you don't have to worry about prairie vole. Prairie voles don't live in the Northeast of the United States, that is, right? So they don't live in the Northeast. But what if you're living in Ohio? Can you have prairie voles? How do you know when you're putting this rodenticide, this bait station outside and the client says, you know, I got voles, I want the voles controlled. Uh, and you're putting your bait stations within 100 feet of the structure, you're following the label, you're not putting it in gardens, you're following the label. But did you check to see if the person had prairie voles? How do you tell them apart? Let's go back to that document again. Uh, are you able to tell them apart by looking at them? Well, let's take a look at some of the data here. It says head and body measure of metal vole. Let me kind of blow this up a little bit more. All right, let's blow this up. We're just going to talk about these two voles because these are the ones I have more familiarity with, okay? And plus, they're going to be more common. I'm not an expert in vole identification. I'm not suggesting that I am, okay? But let's just read this. This is a publication from the Land Grant University. This is an important school. Metal vole distributed common across all Wisconsin. Head and tail body, head and body measure four, and four to five inches. Tail adds another one to three inches, depending. Fur is a grizzled appearance with being back with the back being dark brown with red and black highlights belly is grayish meadow voles occupy above ground areas with overgrown grass or meadows as well as long edge of forest lands they are active year-round day and night fair enough prairie vole primarily in the southern and western parts of the state notice primarily the head and body measure four to five inches well that's the same length as the meadow vole Tail adds another 1 to 1.5 inches. Well, there's a little difference there, a little bit shorter, but it's still enough overlap that you could have one 1.5 inches, and you could think, well, it's just a short, short-tailed meadow vole. Prairie vole's long, coarse fur is grizzled gray-brown. Well, that's a grizzled appearance over here to the left, with gray-brown to yellow-brown on the back and buff cream on the belly. Is that buff cream or gray? How good is your color vision? Could you tell them apart? Prairie, vole, prairie voles are found in prairies, dry grassy meadows and fields. They are active year round during day and night and they use both above ground runways and underground dens. So how do you tell them apart again? Did you go out into the grassland and set set traps so you could have a body to look at and performing measurements? Were you doing that before you put out the rodenticide to control voles? Or did you just say, hey, we have vole damage here. Let me take that picture, right? We have vole damage here. We're gonna put some toxicant out. And this says voles, even though it specifically says meadow voles, we're gonna put some poison out. Well, you say, well, Stephen, well, maybe, um, maybe, maybe I should just pick a different, a different product that has more voles listed on the label. O okay. Well, let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at another label here. This one is, is this one. Excuse me. Let me get to the next one. This was Brigand. Okay. So we had the first one was a bromethalin bait, Motomco bromethalin, Tomcat. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's again general use. Now we're going to go to Brigand. Here's one. This is a second gen. And uh, Bromodialone. Pretty, pretty, pretty hot stuff here. Pretty, pretty good rodenticide. Okay, in terms of the active ingredient. And let's take a look here. Mice and meadow voles. 
Use restrictions. All right, here we go. Let me blow this up a little bit more. Same, kind of the same thing, different, different document, right? Norway rats, roof rats, house mice, cotton rat, eastern harvest mouse, golden mouse, meadow vole. Mexican wood rat, Polynesian rat, southern plains rat, white-throated wood rat, and again, 100 feet, within 100 feet of man-made structures. Did you hear anything else about a prairie vole? Prairie vole's not listed. So when you're, if you're using this particular product, how do you, are you checking to see if you're dealing with metal voles only or whether there are prairie voles there? Remember the label is the law, right? Now look, I'm not, I'm not judging, I'm not judging people here. I, I'm saying that I'm trying to bring up that I think this is a problem with the way the label is written. I'm not blaming the manufacturers on this, although I hope that by bringing this up to the public, to our industry, perhaps we can get a little bit of pressure. Because I, because when I, my communication with the EPA, they're concerned, obviously, that we need with rodenticides because they're dangerous, and they are. They can kill a lot of different animals, and we need to be careful with these, right? This is a dangerous, these are dangerous products, and we as professionals need to use them wisely and appropriately, right? So this is serious stuff. We get a little cavalier sometimes, oh, this is serious. So the EPA obviously, and rightly I would argue, is concerned about poisoning of non-target animals. And so that's why on our labels, on our rodenticide labels, they're very specific about what species we can cover. They no longer just simply give us a genus, right? You can control this, with this product, all, all voles, microtus, and just say microtus, S P P dot microtus. That's well, you'd have uh, probably a dozen or more voles that you could control with it. Well, obviously they're concerned about that, and I think rightly so. Some states have restrictions and protections on certain voles because they're threatened or endangered within their states, and so we don't want people out there just willy-nilly poisoning voles uh, without some sort of without understanding what the, what they're doing, right? Just putting out poison because they're having to itch. My argument, however, is, is that how do we help applicators distinguish voles on a practical basis? You can't just simply say metal vol unless you're giving, unless it's easy enough in the field, in a field context, for them to identify that this is a metal vole versus another vole that's not on the label. When we talk about roof rats or Norway rats, there are, there are enough indicators where you can probably identify what that is. And besides, they're both listed on the label, so it doesn't matter. You just say, rat? And we're you know, in downtown New York City or something. It, they're not gonna have bushy tail wood rats in downtown Manhattan, right? So it's not going to have, not going to be an issue there. So obviously, geographically, there's some differences. But when we have a species, species like uh, meadow voles and prairie voles that can occupy the same landscape, how are we to tell the applicator which is which? And so my suspicion is Many pest control operators just go to the go to the job and let me go back to the, the photo here, see damage like this, and they say, voles. And they look at the label, ignore the issue that it says metal vol, and apply the bait. Voila, all said and done, even though the damage could have been done by prairie vol, which was not on the label. See the problem? Excuse me. Do you see the do you see the issue? That is the that is the problem that we have here. In other words, the way the label is written, it it almost encourages sort of Ill illegal behavior by people that don't want to be illegal. And I think that's a problem. And so my contention is that we need labels to be much more much broader in their writing because Vol damage is very indicative. In other words, you're not gonna, if, if we're dealing with mice, you're not gonna have, mice are not gonna do damage like this. 
voles will do damage like this. So if we can just say voles on the label, like microtus, and then for those states that have restrictions on voles, because maybe there's an endangered or threatened species there, then make the appropriate changes or additions on the label for those states, rather than punishing, making all of these other pesticide applicators across the country using the product illegal. And this is not just to mention just pesticide applicators. Think of all the general use people that don't have any training whatsoever that are using it illegally. It just seems silly to me. Let me continue a little bit more. Well, Stephen, is there any hope here? Well, let's, um, let's kind of take a look here. Let's take a look at another one. Let's take a look at ZP Ag pellets, all right? So let me kind of blow this up a little bit more. It's pretty small. Ten oh, and I can't, oh gosh. All right, well, this is a problem. I have a few highlighted areas here. Now notice with this one, now ZP, zinc phosphide is often used, has a lot of agricultural uses, so it often has very broad labels in terms of number of animals you can control. And that, in this regard, it's often different than your anticoagulants. But let's take a look at this one. I'm just looking here at non-residential lawns, ornamentals, golf courses, and parks. And it says use restrictions for the control of meadow voles, prairie voles, pine voles, California voles, except the endangered subspecies, and then it gives some restrictions. Now notice in this one, notice how much easier it is to follow the label on this because it's, it includes prairie voles and meadow voles at the same time. So, and even pine voles, right? So you have a much broader application use with this. I would still love to have this included into montane voles and some other voles so it's but it's much better this is progress for this one but what about those anticoagulant ones so this so this is an improvement and again this one's a restricted use pesticide so interesting how the general use pesticide just often has a metal vole but anyone can use it and they're probably and many are probably using it to poison prairie voles unnecessarily and uh, illegally I guess for lack of a better word I don't know what else to call it all right let's take a look at one more let's take a look at a, an anticoagulant here this is rosal volbate and notice how this one is written for the control of voles and it gives us microtus spp dot that means any vole in the microtus genus you can whack it with this bait provided you have the right site pretty good this is awesome this is the kind this is what i'm asking for for all of the other rodenticides that have voles on them it because you may say well we don't want people using these products out in the middle of the woods yes but those products already have restrictions on how far away from a structure you can use them the rosal vole bait is a more agricultural area it's not to be used in people's lawns so it's a different product all together right so uh, you know non-crop areas we can discuss that a little bit, little bit more but it's primarily for a more agricultural you know large landscape area not for urban urban areas per se okay but i'll i'll let you discuss that with their with the manufacturer and enforcement within your particular state but notice that is the kind of label i'm wanting us to have because now if you see vol damage and that's and it's pretty clear when you're getting into vol damage okay i can use this product rather than is this a a metal vol a prairie vol and how do you are you going to set a trap and then get it identified how is that practical so some of you may be wondering, well, Stephen, well, how do we distinguish them? Well, I, I am going to take the time to identify these animals, and I'm going to make sure I'm using the label properly. Uh, God bless you. That's awesome. And I, and here we go. So here's a publication published in 1957. It's called The Identification, Ecology, and Reproduction of Microtus in Ohio. Published by, uh, written by G.E. DeCourcy Jr. and was published in the Journal of Mimology, Volume 38, Issue 1 on February 25th, 1957, pages 44 through 52. So let me repeat that. So this is G E D DeCourcy, D E capital C O U R S E Y comma Jr. 
published in 1957 in the Journal of Mammalogy, Volume 38, Issue 1. Article is Identification, Ecology, and Reproduction of Microtus in Ohio. Now, you're not going to be able to get this online. This is behind a firewall. But you will be able to find some other publications on the identification of voles. But this is one I just pulled up. So let's take a look at this one a little bit more carefully. What he did here, let me find the right spot. So an attempt was made, he says, to collect Microtus. Again, that's the genus of a lot of your voles. Microtus from this area, an area in, in Ohio, and compare ecology and reproduction in two species. The measurements, he's also looking to identify the differences between them. So he said the feature that distinguishes Microtus ochraster, that's the prairie vole, and other subspecies of Microtus is the absence of a buffy color on the belly. And so his hypothesis is that Microtus pennsylvanicus, that's the meadow vole, has six plantar tubercles and M and Microtus ochrogaster only has five, has been discussed and discarded. So I think he's referring there to the, to the pads on the feet. And so the theory was we can tell the two species apart by looking at the pads on the feet, if I'm reading this correctly. So he's asking the question, how do we distinguish these two species conclusively? And so what he says is, he looks at fur, let me kind of scroll down a little bit farther, he does all this sort of data, collects over 300 of these things. So he collects 377 prairie voles and 303 meadow voles. And what he says is this, dentition was the only consistently satisfactory feature found for distinguishing meadow vole from prairie vole. Identification of most specimens was possible by the means of the fur and measurements, but this method was not infallible. In other words, you could take measurements, certain, there are certain measurements on the, on the animal itself, and look at its fur, and that would give you a high probability that you would be correct, but you would still be wrong a certain amount of time. Why? Because there's an overlap on the measurements between meadow vole and prairie vole. So at the extremes, they're different, but there's enough overlap that you're gonna have a certain percentage where your measurements are gonna overlap, and you're not gonna be able to tell whether this is a prairie vole or meadow vole. But looking at their teeth gives you a 100% accuracy in terms of separating a prairie vole from a meadow vole. Well, let's take a look at that. So when was the last time you checked the teeth of your voles to make sure you weren't poisoning the wrong species? Just, just a question I was asking there. So let's take a look here. And you're looking here at the molars, the molars of these animals. And what it says here, it's a little small. Let me see if I can blow it up a little bit more. Okay, so here we go. You said, notice figures one through eight, enamel pals of the third molars of the upper jaws of Microtus. Ochrogaster, that's the prairie vole, that's one through five. So figures one through five give you what the prairie vole teeth look like, their molar, their third molar. And six through eight show you what the meadow vole looks like. Now notice the difference between the two of them, right? One of them is you just see a lot more curly cues on the, moles, the molars of the meadow vole than you do the prairie vole. So when was the last time you looked at the teeth of a metal vole or a prairie vole to see if what it, what it was? So what do you, what, you didn't? So is this practical? Am I crazy or am I just much ado about nothing here or is this something that's a problem? Are we, if we're really gonna follow the label, are we checking to ensure that the voles, we would have to trap a few voles kill them, open up their mouth, check the teeth, that molar to see if this is a metal vole or is this a prairie vole or is this something else. I just think that that's not practical for 
the pest control industry. I, maybe I'm wrong. I I'll just put that out there to you to think about it. But I think this is a problem, and I think that this is it's a correctable problem in my opinion. And I don't, and it's and I'm not trying to make a mountain out of a molehill here, but I think it does require the EPA to allow pesticide manufacturers to update their labels so that this particular problem can go away because I just don't think it's practical to say you have to you have to check the teeth of these animals to make sure I just think it's not it's not practical so that's basically where I'm going here uh, you know so if you want to look at the teeth notice how many cur curves you have you have six where on the prairie vole you only have four six and four six and four is that reasonable I'm gonna leave that to you well I probably gave you a lot to think about today I want to thank you very much for watching or listening to whichever way you're gonna be taking in the show we're really glad to have you on board and again take a few moments to subscribe to our podcast to join us on Facebook we'd love to have you and communicate with you if you have questions or issues that you would love to see covered by living the wildlife vodcast uh, definitely reach out to me I'm at wildlife control consultant at gmail.com that's wildlife control consultant at gmail.com I'd love to hear from you and remember uh, my tagline we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care.